Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you here today. Uh, this is an exciting day. It's the beginning of our fall schedule and a new sermon series, and I want to talk to you about that in a bit. But first, I, I want to make an announcement that uh, many of you know, but I just want all of us to know this very important bit of news. Uh, you've seen Brianna is kind of growing these days. That's because she's pregnant. So we wanted all of you to, to know about that. Um, it's kind of funny today, and as we were getting ready to come out here, she said, I don't feel very good today. So pray for her as uh, she continues to work. And I said, when, when's your due date? February 20th. And of course, we have to say, way to go, John, too. He had something to do with <laughs> our sound guy up there. <laughs> I keep telling him his name is going to be Gunter Knudsen. So just so you all know, that's the name of this child. <laughs> okay, so today, uh, <laughs> I'm bound and determined. We're all going to call him Gunter. Uh, today, we're starting this sermon series called The Three Gs, Grace, Gratitude, and Generosity. And uh, there are these little bookmarks all over the place. You can get them on tables in the back and on the patio. And they have the titles and the uh, passages of scripture that we'll be looking at for the next three months. So this is going to take us to the Sunday before Thanksgiving. So it's going to be a long series. I have to tell you, this is uh, my heart, this series. This is my theology. Man, this gets down to the marrow of my bones. And so I'm really excited. I've been waiting to do this series. Uh, and it's really kind of my sense of what the Christian life, how it should be lived. You know, that we're grounded in God's grace. Ah, oh, that there's no doubt that this is uh, one of the fundamental um, uh, truths of our existence, if not the fundamental truth. And then we respond to that with gratitude. Our whole lives are lived in gratitude. We're at our very best when we're grateful. And then... Uh, we reach out to the world with generous lives uh, in every way, not just with our money, but we're magnanimous, generous people, just like God. So I'm really excited about this. So pick that up. And I don't know if you know, but we also have study guides that are scattered around here every Sunday. Uh, so for this next week, you'll pick up a study guide that will go over. They'll have questions about the sermon and about this passage of scripture. You can use it in a small group or your own private study. You can also find those online. They're posted online as well. So I got to tell you, I'll get fired up at certain points during the sermon series. I'm pretty passionate about this. So just forewarning. We're going to look at Genesis 1 today which usually people don't really associate with God's grace, but oh boy, it's a great picture of God's grace. So let me uh, read this to you. I wish I had time to read the whole chapter, but we're gonna go to day one and then we're gonna jump to day six uh, and then finish up with day seven. Listen to God's word for us today. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless, and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and, he called, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And then God created all the heavens and the earth and the animals and the vegetation and all that is God created. And then we come to the apex of this passage, which is amazing. It's us, humankind being created. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the other wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. 
So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Lord, may you speak to us this morning in this, from this beautiful passage of scripture and from the meditation of my heart. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of grace, a very generous, self-giving, loving God who created all there is out of love. So Lord, speak to us today. May we begin to gain a better understanding of your grace and love for us. Speak, we pray in Christ's name, amen. You know, for a number of years, I was a youth pastor and every year I would take a group of students on a backpacking trip to Yosemite. One of the cool things about being a youth pastor is you decide what you wanna do and then you make the kids do it. So. That's what I did. I loved Yosemite and I loved backpacking. So every year we would go. And on one particular year, we started the the backpacking trip in Tuolumne Meadows, that, oh, one of my favorite places on earth. That high elevation, high altitude uh, meadow in Yosemite. It's just beautiful. This meadow surrounded by all these granite domes. And on the first night that we were there, we had finished Uh, making dinner and cleaning up. And I told the kids, I said, hey, let's go out on the meadow and just enjoy. So we went out on the meadow and uh, it was just simply a gorgeous night. Man, cool, crisp, clear air. Do you remember that? Cool, crisp air. (laughs) You know, you sold me on the weather in San Clemente. I'm not so sure about this right now. But that's what it was. Cool, crisp, just beautiful night. And one of my favorite sounds is the wind blowing in the top of pine trees. You know that sound? You could hear that, and you could hear the Tuolumne River just falling over some rocks and a little bit of noise in the distance in the campground. But other than that, just, just silence. I was a good youth pastor. I was actually able to get these kids to sit down and be quiet. And I said, let's just enjoy this because we didn't know it at the time, but we were just about to be treated to maybe one of the most beautiful sights all of us will have seen in our whole lives. Because the sun began to set. And as it began to set, you know, the sky just started changing colors and God the artist just began to splash colors on his canvas. Oranges and pinks and reds and magentas and violets, purple. Just this continual unfolding of color. And 
as the colors began to just unfold like that, honestly, we just almost felt like we were swimming in a sea of color. <laughs> like we were enveloped. Because as the sky started changing color, wow, all those white granite domes, they began to reflect those colors. So it was just this, this sea of color. Absolutely amazing. And finally the, the sun set, and we were just all sitting there in awe. And then, you know, the reds and the magentas and all those began to give way to these derp, deep purples and violets. And finally the black of the, the sky. And these little things started appearing in the sky called stars. <laughs> just twinkling. And then, if that wasn't enough, from behind the biggest dome came this light. And it was just like a flashlight, like this huge flashlight was behind the dome. And it just got brighter and brighter and brighter. And we saw the tip of the moon just coming over the granite dome. And it came higher and higher. And full moon just washed the whole meadows and valley in light. awesome. We just sat there in awe. What a gift. You know, it's one of those moments in life when you really realize you're very aware that you have just been given a gift in the truest sense of the word. You know, we did nothing to deserve it. <laughs> we couldn't have. We didn't even think of it. We didn't even scheme to get it. We couldn't have purchased that. We couldn't have bought it. We couldn't have stole it. We were just recipients. What? You know what it is of God's grace, God's goodness. It was though God just said, hey, take this. What do you think? about this and gave us this great gift. That's great, grace. And as we go through this series of sermons, now this is a great picture to begin with. Honestly, that is a picture of grace. And this first chapter of Genesis really is a beautiful picture of God's grace. And see, we usually don't think of the Old Testament being full of grace. We think, oh, the God of the Old Testament, he's kind of a grumpy old God, you know? And grace comes in the New Testament with Jesus Christ. And oh no, God is a God of grace from the very beginning. And here we see on the very first page of the Bible, this amazing outpouring of grace. It's right here at the beginning from the very first sentence, and God created. Wow, that is a statement of grace. He spoke, and everything was created, free for all people, over the top, generous, luxurious grace. Here's what I want to do today. I want to look at this passage and I want to quickly just point out four characteristics of grace that I see from this chapter, from Genesis. And the first one is this. Grace is common. Grace is common. We often don't think of it, but God's grace is common to all people. All of us are recipients of God's grace. Last night, my wife and I were at the Fisherman out on the pier, and we were sitting there eating clam chowder and having a drink and watching the sunset and watching the surfers and hearing the waves. And I thought, oh, man, what a gift of God's grace. Just God's goodness. I thought, God is so good. He's given me this great wife, this great place to live the beauty of his creation. And I looked around at all those people sitting around with the candle on the table and all this beauty. And I thought, you know, they may not know it. They may not acknowledge it, but oh, this is a gift from God. This is grace. 
when we sit down with a cup of coffee and have a conversation with our friend, and man, our hearts are joined together, our souls meet, that's a gift of grace, isn't it? It's nothing that we can earn, it's nothing that we can create, it's, it's a gift of grace when a, our child or our grandchild hops up into our lap and, and puts his or he, her head on our, our, our chest and falls asleep and we hold them, oh, that's a gift of grace, isn't it? I often think some of the greatest things in life are those things that just come to us like this. Just these little gifts of grace. Most of the time unexpected, like that sunset in Tuolumne Meadows. God just blesses us. Theologians have coined a term for this. They call it common grace. And I wanted to distinguish this right at the beginning of this series. It's different from special grace or saving grace. That's what we usually think of when we think of grace, isn't it? It's the work of Jesus Christ to give us new life, to save us. That's grace as well, special grace. But common grace is also very much in Scripture. Jesus talked about it. In the Sermon on the Mount, do you remember what he said? He said, you know, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Because your heavenly Father, you know what? He loves everybody. He's an indiscriminate lover. He loves good people and bad people. You know what? He makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God is indiscriminate in pouring out his grace, is he not? God loves the scoundrel and he loves the saint. God loved Hitler and he loved Mother Teresa equally. His love is unconditional. It's not based at all on our behavior. He just, for whatever reason, he just loves his creation, his people. Now, sometimes that gets us mad, even. I've been in Bible studies where we talk about this. And, oh, people just get angry. You mean God loves Hitler? God loves those ISIS terrorists? Yeah, he does. As much as he loves you. That isn't fair. Well, grace isn't fair. Grace is grace. It's not fair. God's grace is common. Second thing I want to point out about this is God's grace is free. It's free. It's absolutely free. You know, this is why creation is such an act of grace. What did we do to deserve creation? Nothing. It's just this gift. We didn't do anything to deserve it. In fact, we can't do anything to deserve it, can we? It's this gift of God. It's this free, free gift. He created everything out of nothing. The only material he had was his heart. And he gives it to us. You know, when we look at creation, we see grace so, so clearly because we see the nature of God. He wasn't compelled to do this. He didn't have to do it. He did it because it's his nature. He's a giving God, self-giving, emptying God. He just wants to bless his people. He just wants to give. There's no deficiency in God that had to be met through creation of us. No, he just gave it free. Benjamin Warfield gave a great definition of love. He says, grace is the unmerited favor, the unmerited favor of God toward the undeserved. Undeserved favor, unmerited love. Here's what Frederick Beekner, a Presbyterian pastor and author says. This is so good. He says, grace is something you can never get but only be given. There's no way to earn it or deserve it or bring it about any more than you can deserve the taste of raspberries and cream, or earn good looks, or bring about your own birth. You ever thought about that? A good sleep is grace. 
and so are good dreams. Most tears are grace. The smell of rain is grace. Do you remember that smell? Somebody loving you is grace. Loving somebody is grace. All these gifts. Let's make it really personal. You know, what did you have to do with your own birth? You couldn't do anything. God gives you this gift. A little girl was once asked, you know, where did you get those big brown eyes? And she said, mm, they came with my head. <laughs> That's as good as answer as any, isn't it? I mean, what did she do to deserve it? I remember I was really struck with just grace being this, this, this free gift and receiving, receiving something that I could never earn or, or make on my own at the birth of our children. Uh, if you've had that privilege of, of being at the birth of a child, it's one of those crystallizing moments in life, isn't it? Where you just realize, wow, I'm part of something much bigger than me. You know, I remember our firstborn, Drew, and when, uh, you know, the, the birth was finally over, and my first thought was, wow, I'm glad that's over. I'm really tired. That was a lot of work. <laughs> no, I thought, wow, my wife is amazing. What a soldier. That was intense. But then you get this little child, and you get to cut the umbilical cord, and, and I remember just holding him and, and being struck by this miracle. I could have never done anything to create this amazing little kid. It's a gift, just this, this free gift. So God's grace is common, it's free. It's also very generous. God's grace is extravagantly, really over the top, kind of generous, and we see this in this creation story. Man, think about this, this, this sunset or these sunsets we watch. You know, God could have just, he could have done it like a PowerPoint presentation, right? Red for a while, and then a new screen, orange, and then yellow, and then black, right? No, what does he do? He gives us this amazing unfolding drama every night. Everyone different, absolutely different. He's over the top, generous. And as you think about, oh, this story of the God creating the living creatures and the birds of the sky and the species and all this stuff, wow, you just realize he's just extravagant in his grace. I mean, just think of animals. He could have just created, you know, a few animals, horses and dogs and cats. And, but no, he goes off and he creates what? Giraffes. I remember going to the San Diego Zoo a couple years ago and just, I sat at the giraffe exhibit for probably a half an hour just looking at these things. You know, they're so tall. They're so weird. It's like, who could have created something like this? So extravagant. And then, you know, they give you those little things you can buy to feed the giraffes and they have those long tongues that come down. <laughs> extravagant over the top. And when you think about creation and the number of species, you know, biologists think they've cataloged 1.5 to maybe 1.8 million species on Earth. And the estimates range from the true number of living species range from 3.6 million to maybe 100 million species. And here's what's amazing. Scientists think 95% of species are now extinct. That's extravagant. In this little corner of a national park in Peru, there are 1,300 butterfly species just alone. I had a guy in my last church grew camellias. 600 species of camellias. Amazing. Or think of the size of the universe. You know, God could have just created this little thing. No, what does he do? <laughs> Creates this massive, massive 
space out there that continues to grow. Just our own little universe is so just this little tiny bit of the created order. You know, Voyager 2, it took 12 years to get just to the rim of our solar system. It was going 60,000 miles per hour, 2.8 billion miles. I'd say that's extravagant, huge. He spoke it all into existence out of love. The last thing I'd say about grace from this passage is it's relational. Amazing to think about all that I just described, all these pictures of God's extravagant grace, and then to realize that the high point of creation is us, humankind. And maybe here, exactly here is where we see God's grace most clearly. God creates because he wants to be in relationship with us. He wants to share life. He wants to give life to us. Amazing. He's self-giving. He's generous. And we, in creation, we see, man, like I said, God doesn't have to do this for any reason except he, just out of love. It's like Jonathan Edwards says, you know, he has a disposition to abundant communication. He just wants to communicate with his people and be in relationship with us. And we see this most clearly, what? In the life and the ministry and the death of Jesus Christ, God's desire to come and be in relationship with us. Let me close with this. You know, the Old Testament root of the New Testament word for grace is a picture. And Hebrew is very, it paints pictures. And here's the picture. It's a monarch, an absolute monarch, king or queen, bending down to give something to a powerless peasant. Doesn't have to do it. But that's the picture. And oh, don't we see this in creation? Oh my gosh, this great, big, powerful, transcendent, completely, totally other God, this God who shatters our imagination, this God who spoke and all of this was created. This God bends down to us and wants to be in relationship with us out of what? Pure grace. And so when I try to think of the application for this sermon, you know, we got to apply this. What's the application? Well, it's very simple. How do we respond to this? And see, that's what I think the purpose of this passage of Scripture, Genesis 1, like I said a few weeks ago, it's not a science book. It's poetry. And what it hopes to evoke in us is what? Awe and humility. What I think the writer is trying to do is to just get us down on our, our knees and just look up at the sky and go, oh my gosh, how magnificent is this God who created all of this? It's like, I think our response, I hope our response is like the psalmist when he writes, oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have established, what are human beings? Oh, great question. What are human beings that you are even mindful of them? Mortals, that you care for them. Oh, Lord our God. How majestic is your name. Praise God for your grace. Amen.
Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this great passage of scripture, for just this outpouring, this picture of the, the outpouring of, of your free love, unmerited favor, undeserved favor and grace toward us. Lord, may we be people that open our eyes and see the everyday gifts of grace that you give us, whether it is a great meal with a friend or conversation or the beauty of creation or, or, a, or a good wave or whatever it may be, Lord, may we just always be mindful that these all come from you. that they are gifts of your great love, grace. And Lord, as we come to the table today, may we also remember that the greatest display, demonstration of your self-giving, of your desire to be in relationship with us, to give us life, is your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we come to this table, may we be very aware that he died for us so that we might live. So feed us, nurture us, equip us so we may then go out and feed a hungry world. In Christ's name we pray, amen.